Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Today, I have a LinkedIn evangelist. Yes, I said it. LinkedIn evangelist. He is outstanding, and I am so proud and happy to have him on the show with me. His name is Mike Shayla. Mike, tell us about yourself. Well, Mike, I like to think of myself as a LinkedIn evangelist. And what that really means is I've been a LinkedIn user now for 10 years, and I've gotten a lot of success out of it. I've had a lot of good experiences with it, and I am a heavy LinkedIn user. And the more and more I engage with people, the more I hear them say, oh, well, I have a LinkedIn profile, but I don't really do a whole lot with it. And they they kind of look down at their feet like, you know, they're in trouble. Well, it's it's because we probably are if we're talking to someone in your caliber. It's like, it's embarrassing. Because I fit that category, by the way. I looked at my LinkedIn. I have one. I can't tell you why. I just was told by my... (laughs) My social guy, he says, let me, let me create you a LinkedIn account. And I oh, okay. And then someone sends me a, a something on LinkedIn and I, ah, I have no clue how to do this. So I am, I am, I have, I have been a virgin in a long time, people, but I'm a LinkedIn virgin. If there is such a thing, I am that thing. So I hope you set my mind free today. Great. That, that, that's my that's my favorite opportunity as long as people are open to the idea of learning because it is such a tremendous resource. And I'll give you a great example. I was doing a one-on-one coaching session with a college student a couple months ago, and she had a very interesting story. Her family is originally from Russia. She moved here when she was very young and is getting ready to graduate from college. And we were talking through different strategies to help her find a job. And one of the things I had mentioned is you want to connect to everybody. You want to connect with former coworkers. You want to connect with current coworkers. You want to connect with professors from college. You want to connect with your friends. I said, you want to connect with your family. And she very quickly said, oh, my parents aren't on LinkedIn. I said, oh, you never know. And we were doing some research, and there's a great little function on LinkedIn where it points out, people that you may know. And she says to me, oh my gosh, there's my mom. And I said, you see, you were convinced your mom doesn't have a profile. How do you know one of her connections isn't the person that's going to introduce you to the job of your dreams? And that's what I love about LinkedIn is the potential, the opportunity for great connections, building a great career, and being as successful as you want to be and really calling your own shots instead of being dependent on other people. See, now I coach real estate investing quite a bit. And one of the things that I harp on way, way too little, if I could harp on it more, I would, is the idea of marketing to your center of influence. So when you use the connect to everybody phrase, I instantly went back to my center of influence harping that I've done in the past where I think that's a, that's an outstanding way to get business. We just have to tell those people that know of us, that know us to tell those people that they know what we do. So can yep. link, is that what you're describing? Can LinkedIn do that kind of thing for me? With LinkedIn, you have two real ways to get business, what I call passive and active prospecting. And when I say prospecting, whether you're a young college student looking to get a job or you are a business professional looking to find your next client, they're they're both the same idea. With the passive attraction, what you're doing is certainly you're creating a quality profile. You're getting a professional headshot taken. You're using keywords and using them in a conversational manner, not just cramming them into your profile. You're making your profile full and complete. You're letting people know if you speak more than one language, that you speak more than one language. If you volunteer at your church, if you volunteer for a nonprofit, if you volunteer in your community, you're letting people know that. You're articulating it. You're sharing your successes, and you're leveraging 
the great people that have helped you be successful. And then once you've built that profile, and I tell people that building a great LinkedIn profile takes probably two hours of really hard work. And once you're done with that, then it's just daily maintenance. Now, for somebody like me, I'm a sales professional. I've been in sales since 1996, and I will probably always be in sales in one way or another. I am a very heavy LinkedIn user, and I have people all the time say to me, well, Mike, my business doesn't fit into that, or I'm not a salesperson. Why do I want a LinkedIn profile? And I have a couple of responses to that. First, everybody is a salesperson. I'll give you a great example. There was a company here in Maryland where I live that I really wanted to do business with. And one of the people that I would call upon is director of IT. I identified who he was. I found his profile on LinkedIn. I had a couple of people that were mutual connections with him. And I asked them to introduce me. And they did. And he just ignored me. I guess I wasn't worth his time. Okay, fine move along, try to build another relationship in that company. I actually ended up building a great relationship with the VP of IT in his company. And about a year later, that company merged with another company and all of my contacts were on the outs. Everything that they'd done, which had been done in Maryland, was now being done out of Texas. Here's your gold watch. Your services are no longer needed. And that first director, the one that ignored me for all those years, sends me a connection request on LinkedIn. And he sent it to me because he needed the job. Now, suddenly, I was perceived as valuable. I now had leverage for him, whereas before, in his mind, I was just another annoying salesperson. No, salespeople are never annoying. Most of us are. Most of us are incredibly annoying. And that's one of the things that I want to help salespeople overcome is it's more about making the connection, nurturing and developing, not trying to sell anything for a very long time. And that's hard for a lot of salespeople to wrap their head around the idea of what do you mean I'm not selling something? You're not selling something. You're, you're building a level of trust that when that customer does need something that fits into what you do, first, you're top of mind, and second, you're thought of as a trusted partner to do those things. And LinkedIn helps you do that. My favorite thing about LinkedIn is you can put a daily update to share content relevant to your industry. And getting back to your real estate scenario, it's a great place for realtors to market themselves because if there's one thing I've come to learn about the real estate industry is it is constantly changing. There are new rules. There are new guidelines. How is the Fed influencing interest rates? All of these factors that change daily and they impact a family's decision to buy a home. And when you as a realtor can convey that information and deliver that information with absolutely no expectation of reciprocity. You're just doing this to benefit those people. The majority of those people by human nature are going to look at you and say, that's somebody I want to do business with. That's someone who I want to help me find my home because they understand this industry and they understand me. They're sharing content that I have read and said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I get that. So now I call that kind of marketing or the two types of marketing, that kind of marketing is uh, reinforcement. The, the active, I want to, you know, buy it today is a call to action marketing. And so I can absolutely see where we all, irrespective of our industry, should be telling people that we're the professional to go to when they in fact do need our product. And at the same time, sell a product. Correct. To those that need it now, because we, we I guess we never really know when someone needs their product. But building that, that sense of professionalism in the, in the real estate investment business, we need all the help we can get because of, <laughs> of our, you know, National Association of Realtors and other realtors who are spending thousands and millions of dollars on marketing propaganda that their way of doing things is the way that it should be done. On the other side of the fence, we need that professionalism for ourselves. So 
LinkedIn probably could help us with that. Yes, big help. So what are the steps to LinkedIn success? Once you've built the profile and you've gone through all of those stages, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you can build a great profile right at the end. Okay. You then want the active engagement, doing those daily updates. One of my favorite components to LinkedIn is what they call Pulse, which is their blog platform. You don't have to set up a WordPress or go to Blogger or anything like that. If you have a LinkedIn account, boom, you can start blogging today. And even non-LinkedIn members can read that blog because it will show up in Google search rankings. Interesting. And with it, the, the real value is you don't have to be a great writer to take advantage of the LinkedIn Pulse capabilities. I My degree is English literature, and I love writing. I wrote hundreds of papers in the five years I was in college. And yes, I wrote, I said five years. But I, I enjoy that. And I also recognize a lot of people don't enjoy that. Whatever your industry is, the process I recommend is Monday through Thursday, you find one article that really resonated with you. And in your daily update, you share that article and you invite conversation around that article. You post it, All of your connections see it, and you're asking simple questions like, I just saw this today. Has this ever happened to you, and how did you deal with it? And you can vary the questions every day. Hey, I just saw this. This worked really well for me. Have you had a different experience, or what other methods have you used to overcome this issue? And you're getting engagement with your audience. On Friday, you're going to put together a summary post, but this is going to go into the LinkedIn pulse. This is going to be the blog. And what you do is you write two to three sentences about each post from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, just real quickly. You know, on Monday we talked about this and then you show the link. And I loved this component. This was the, this was the aha moment that I took from this article. What, what stood out to you? And you go through each one of them like that. And then your summary paragraph is, In these four articles today, we learned A, B, C, and D. What do you think should be the next steps in order to secure success for us? And now you're in a blog format. The people that aren't connected to you are seeing this as well. And they're getting more, you're getting interaction, not only from your connections, but from people from the outside world. And you're raising your visibility level. And you're being positioned as a thought leader. And then the next step that you could take with that, you posted that blog on a Friday. The following Monday, you're getting ready to do your new update so that you can do your next post on Friday. You can take the blog that you just did, and you can now share it in your LinkedIn groups. Groups are valuable for a couple of reasons. First, on LinkedIn, you can join up to 100 groups. You can join groups that are based on geography. You can join groups based on an industry. You can join groups based on an interest. You can join groups based on a community. And what all of them do is give you an audience that is like-minded on several key components. You can join a group for your peers, for real estate professionals. You can join a group for people looking to buy a home. You can join a group for the city that you live in. And with each of these, you now have the opportunity to push your blog out even farther by saying, hi, everyone, I posted this blog on Friday, and I would love to get your impression of its value. What moments did you take away from this that you think can help you in your current role? And because you have 100 groups that you can join, Mm -hmm. you post this to 10 or 15 groups a day, and by next Friday, you've touched every group. You've gotten conversations going in every group. And as a result, you're going to grow your network because there are going to be people that naturally read and enjoy what you're doing and they're going to want to connect with you. And you're building up your network. Right. That makes total sense. I'm thinking of the amount of money that I've, I've not made because I've not done this. That's, that's a shame. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Well, it, you know, Facebook scares me enough. And then LinkedIn was... For me, anyway, it was like this, like this foreign thing because it was so, like, so businessy, and it was from my perspective, looking at it, not as fun. I know. Sure. 
Work's not supposed to be fun, but I, I try to make it fun. But it, it didn't look fun. So how do we make LinkedIn fun? Well, that, that's a very real objection. And LinkedIn recognized that. LinkedIn has a very tight relationship with the developers at Apple. And about two months ago, they launched a new LinkedIn app specifically for the iOS-based products. So the look and feel on your iPhone, your iPad, even on, if you have a Mac, it's very different than the Galaxy base or the traditional PC. And they took that moment that you just described and said the interface seems too stiff. It's too serious. And they gave it a little bit more of an intuitive Facebook feel. They really worked very hard to make some change. Now they got backlash about it because they took away features that people love and so on and so forth. It's part of the process, right? Yeah, like everything else, this, change. Someone's yeah. going to get frustrated because there's change. And then other yeah. people will get frustrated because there wasn't enough change. It's like, okay, whatever. Yeah. But, but they, they heard that concern and they really worked at it. And you, you made a, a great point. I, I love Facebook. I'm on there all the time. I have a Facebook page for my Mike Shula Consulting. But I have my, my personal account, and that's really where I do most of my, my fun. Right. One of the things that really frustrates me about Facebook, though, is they don't let me know what's going on with most of my network. They've got an algorithm that says, okay, these are the people that Mike interacts with the most, so let's tell him what they're doing. Right. The other 70% of the people in his universe don't matter. It, it, it frustrates me, the fact that they're filtering and censoring mm-hmm. For me, it just drives me crazy. And, yes. and it drives my wife crazy. Who's not a, you know, she's more of a Facebook fun person than I am. I do a little bit of Facebook business stuff, but for her, she's going, I know these people are posting. Why can't I see their stuff? And it's well, honey, because Facebook's not saying that they want you to. <laughs> so and they've decided that you're not interested in that. Right. Yeah. For us. And they're deciding what yeah. we should be interested in in some occasions, which is kind of crazy. Yep. But that's a whole different conversation, I'm sure. Yeah. How does LinkedIn help in that arena? They're they're not filtering. Oh. You can't now. They they do have one of their one of their little tweaks that if you're on your PC when you first log in and you see your home screen, they default to top stories. Okay. Kind of like Facebook, they say, okay, these are the popular ones. Let's show him these first. But all you have to do is hit those three little buttons and toggle down to recent, and they will show you everything in the chronological order. And you can go back as far as you like. Wow. And it's, they're not censoring that. So they're giving me all the, all the data or all the feed that's they're, there. They're giving you everything that's there. That's incredible. That's great. Now, one of the, and it may be off topic and I apologize. It was a negative for me, which is one of the other reasons I didn't, I didn't feel gooey about LinkedIn. And is that it kept asking me, do I want to grab my contacts out of Outlook? <laughs> and that's just scared the crap out of me because I've like got thousands upon thousands of contacts in my Outlook. Yeah. And I don't want to lose those contacts. I don't want them to be abused, you know, the, the right to privacy. And so what is that all about inside of LinkedIn? And it, should I be afraid of saying, yeah, use, you know, grab my contacts if you want? I don't think it's ever bad to be cautious. Okay. I think in this instance, you're worrying more than you have to. Okay. What, what I've seen is they will go through because you can do it with Yahoo, you can do it with Gmail, you can do it with all the major mail platforms, not just Outlook. And they will pass that list. They'll go through it, and they'll they will let you know, hey, these 800 people that you've gotten emails from through your Outlook account, have profiles. Would you like to connect with them? And you can pick and choose. There's a button where you can just click all of them, and there is a button that allows you to just pick and choose. Now, the danger is I've had more than one person tell me I didn't mean to do that. I I, I got a connection request from a girl in college and I looked, I know I don't know her. I didn't have any mutual contacts with her. Or I had one mutual contact with her. And sure enough, the mutual contact was her father, somebody that I do know through the university. And I, when I get a connection request from somebody I don't know, instead of ignoring it, 
And instead of blindly accepting it, I always respond. And I say, hey, thanks for reaching out. I don't think we've met before. What about my profile interested in you in connecting? And I give him a few days to respond. And mm-hmm. she got back to me almost immediately and said, I didn't send a connection request to you. LinkedIn made me do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And w- what happened was what somewhat what you just described. She got the the message about possibly doing it, and she didn't turn off the send invites to all. Right. Gotcha. So, so you do have to you do have to you know be a little metered and, and, and take the time to go through that. But yeah, I, I normally just click ignore because LinkedIn already does a really good job of suggesting people that I may already know. Okay. Particularly when you're fairly new to LinkedIn, it's take it's combing all of the information. So it's going to take the name of your college, it's going to take the name of your employers, and it's going to search all of those, and it's going to say, hey. Maybe you know Bob because Bob also worked at XYZ Company back in 2007. And maybe you know Mary because Mary also went to the University of Fill in the Blank in 1998. Well, earlier you spoke about keywords, and when you create your keywords, make them more conversational than just like apples. Is, mm-hmm. Can we talk a little bit about that aspect of it, and which would help, I think, in, in my industry – if if one of my coaching students who's an investor used the appropriate keywords to find like type people, how would they mm-hmm. how would they express in a keyword that's uh, that they buy houses for a living? As an example, what you want to do is you as a person want to say, okay, if I were looking for me on LinkedIn, what words might I search? And you want to start out with really obvious words and you want to build a list of about 20 words and maybe by word number 20, maybe it's not quite so obvious. And you want to start with the very top of your profile right under your name. It's by default, it puts in the job title of your most recent company. You have 120 characters there. You want to remove that and you want to fill that with as many keywords as you can fit into that 120 word character space. And you don't want to worry about making a sentence or making it comprehensible. You want it to be those words that people will find, that people will search. Like red, blue, orange, pink, green. You know, if if those were keywords that defined you, something like that. Okay. Yes. Not that I like red because yes. red's the color of passion. Just put red. Exactly. Because too many people, okay. they'll either put their job title, which is senior account executive, or now with realtor. Real is probably a good keyword, right? Right. And then think about the other words that somebody looking for a realtor might look for. They might look for refinance. They might look for mortgage. They might look for REIT. So you put together that list, and the more of those that you can fit into the top, the higher the likelihood that the person that you want to find you will find you. And then in your summary section where you're telling people why you love to do what you do. And that's a really important piece. Is so many people, when they write their summary first, they write it in the third person, which is a terrible idea. You're not a ghost writer. You're not writing a biography on behalf of someone. You're, you're you. Talk about you from your perspective. Why do you do what you do? When I interview college students, so many times I ask them, so how did you pick the major? And their answer is, Oh, well, I was good at it, or my mom and dad expected me to. I said, no, 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 okay, change that right now. Sure, you can make a living doing something that you're good at. Find something you love, and you'll increase your ability to earn tenfold. Right. Yeah. And it, it sounds like a pipe dream. I, I realize when I say that I sound like a, a, a crazy futurist. I, I, I get that. But there is a lot of truth to that. When you look at people like Steve Jobs, he's so loved computers that it became his life and he became the iconic name in the industry. The Hen and Bill Gates, right? Right. And they both they both tell a very similar story to how they came about doing what they do. So that summary is your chance to tell your your Steve Jobs. It, it really is. Why are you doing what you do and why do you love it? And how does that help? me as a potential person to do business with you. And you've, you've, you've put 
the keywords conversationally into that. Those keywords should resonate with why you do what you love to do. Gotcha. And then when you get to your job description, you want that job description to also reflect why you do what you do. Now, are we using this to meet people or are we using this to meet an employer or is it both at the same time? I really do think it's both at the same time. When I, when I do my presentations, I tell people I average one new connection a day and on average I'm connected, I'm contacted by one new recruiter a week. And they say, wow, how do you keep up with that? I don't well, understand. I don't literally get one connection request a day and one recruiter a week. But when you look back over the last 12 months, that just tends to be how it works out. So I go to a networking event. I'm, I'm doing a presentation next Thursday for a financial company in Towson, Maryland. And in that presentation, I'm going to meet 20 or 30 new people, and I'm going to get 20 or 30 new contacts out of that. And then I might not go to an event like that for two or three weeks. And wouldn't you know it, it's all going to average out to about one new connection a day. And because of how I've structured my profile, the industry I'm in, technology recruiters are always looking for people with my sales background. And I've made myself attractive and easy to find to those recruiters. You're an attractive son of a gun, Mike. I just wanted to say that right now. Get that out of the way, I right? I truly appreciate that. I actually got a connection request. I'm, I'm looking at his picture, folks. Hey, I can absolutely tell you he's not quite Brad Pitt, but um, he's not Festus either. So, no. <laughs> Thank you. My attempt at comedy. I'm sorry. I think I'm funnier as, you know, everything else. I mean, I'm funny. I, I'm the funniest person on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Man. No one gets my sense of humor, but that's okay. That's why I have two me's and I can talk to myself about it. You, you're talking a lot about college students. Why are you, is that an industry that likes LinkedIn or can benefit from LinkedIn? Two separate questions and I'll answer them both. Uh, they don't particularly like okay. LinkedIn, but they absolutely can benefit from it. And I, I deal with a couple of types of people. I deal with people that are searching for a job. Okay. And I deal with sales professionals that are looking to find more customers. And when you look at both designs, they right. have a whole lot in common. Finding a job is a lot like finding a prospect to turn into a customer. Mm -hmm. And the methodologies for both are very similar. Most good salespeople are never out of a job for long because they know how to promote themselves. They know how to make themselves look attractive and they know how to win the opportunity. But for the other 80% of the planet that's not in a traditional sales role, when it comes to marketing themselves, branding themselves, they don't do that until they need to. You know, my, my wife is an accountant, and she's had two jobs in the 20 years that we've been together. And she will frequently complain, oh, I need to find a new job closer to home. And, you know, the list goes on and on. And I say, well, we'll do it. Just, no, I, 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 there are no jobs around where we live. I say, well, that's absolutely not true. You're just not looking for them. And it's a, it's a typical mindset of, you know, I'm safe where I am. I'm comfortable. I'm not happy, but I'm safe and I'm comfortable. And until somebody forces me to, i.e., we're downsized, i.e. we're fired, i.e. they closed my office and unless I want to move to Seattle, Washington, I don't have a job anymore. They don't bother to find a job. Right. And that's why I say build that profile, make yourself attractive because I've had plenty of recruiters contact me in the last six months. Hey, hey, Mike, I've got a great opportunity to talk to you about it. And I say, well, I'm in a really good position right now. This is my salary. This is what I earned, including my commissions last year and the year before. And this is what I'm projected to earn this year. Can you offer me that? Can you offer me better than that? And most of the time I go, no, I can't. I go, great. Keep, keep me on file. And if you come up with something that fits my criteria, let me know. So when I was ready to make a change, I could go back to those people and say, okay, you know what? Uh, I've run my course with my current employer and it's time for me to evaluate a new option. So let's talk. And it's a much easier process. Yes, and it's much easier to have something develop before you need it than to need it and then have to develop it. Yeah, and you don't it doesn't take a lot of hard work. That's the that's the part that people don't get. You know, you're doing those little updates daily, touching your network, reading interesting articles, and LinkedIn will be the first to tell you that they want to be your resource 
for intelligence, meaning that if you're in a sales industry, you're in a technology industry, you're in the financial industry, you can create your profile that you're getting your own private newspaper feeding you nothing but the information relevant to you and your industry. Hmm. And it, it's a quick setup. Read in the morning paper. You don't want to read about the local football game or the last knucklehead that got arrested for trying to steal the pet snake from the library. <laughs> you want to read news relevant to your industry that you can use and make a difference today. You can set your LinkedIn profile up so your feed is filled with nothing but that information. Interesting. Now, you keep saying that I can do this, or, in your, mm-hmm. or not necessarily me, but in the way that you're presenting it, like it's sliced bread, it's so easy. I'm sure it's not that easy. Who do we, who do we like people that aren't, are challenged with LinkedIn, the, the LinkedIn <laughs> challenged people? I'm sure there's a group for that inside LinkedIn. Where do we go? If we want to dive in, if we want to create our aware or our LinkedIn awareness, where do we, how do we do that without having to do that ourselves, without going out and buying one of the, the dummy books on, you know, how to do this? Well, I certainly am biased, but I think if you go to www.mikesheila.com, you'll get a lot of great information. I, I blog pretty frequently about using LinkedIn for success and sharing my best tips and tricks. And anybody that goes to my page can sign up for a free three-page report where I go through your profile and I give you all the top recommendations to get your profile in tip-top shape. And then reading my blogs on a weekly or semi-weekly basis will give you all the other insights to use all the other features and functionality and really get the maximum benefit out of your profile. Interesting. Because I use a guy in off of one of the one of the virtual assistant websites that are out there that does my Facebook stuff. And mm-hmm. and he doesn't do anything LinkedIn for me. I don't know, maybe he just doesn't understand LinkedIn. But for my Facebook stuff, you know, I'm 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 okay with it. I don't know what he if he's doing a good job or a bad job, but it, it looks like it's good to me. So is that's what you're talking about or or are you just talking, you will kind of guide us on what to do, but not do it for us? Or are there people, or do you do it for us? I've had several people ask me about doing it on an ongoing basis, and I'm starting to readdress my position. For the longest time, I said, no, 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 I teach people how to do it. But I've had I, enough for, I've, I've had I, enough I, for, I understand. I'm just, I'm going to cut you off for a second because I'm just bullheaded. <laughs> there are some of us. That we don't want the experience of doing it. Yep. And there are some of us that I preach doing what we do best more than what we don't do best. So do what we don't do best less and do what we Delegate. do best. I, yeah. It's a, so it's a smart let me, you know, business model. So if there are people out there that I can say, hey, I want this professionally done, even if it's just getting it to a place that's now manageable by my myself and then maybe having a a monthly call a review of my LinkedIn account that would be that'd be that that'd be gorgeous to me I'd love that not because I'm lazy but I'm better served doing what makes me money yeah and I, I've had many people ask me about that and I've had to change my position to if they want to do an ongoing relationship with me then we certainly can we'll figure out like you just described your strategy. How do you want to go about using LinkedIn and what, what things do you want to see and do? Part of it is how you handle the interaction. That, that, that really is a, a point to be careful about. Sure. How much freedom do you want to give the administrator, which would be me in this example? How much freedom do you want to give me to respond and answer people's questions? Yeah, and, and that's probably, I, and I can tell that with my Facebook account. And my Facebook account, as well as my LinkedIn, is they're being driven from a content perspective by my WordPress sites. So I don't really go there and say anything. Just what I have said someplace else goes there on my behalf. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know because I'm not touching it personally, um, I'm I'm giving up some of the the benefit to that. Yeah, um, and that's that's one of the decisions you have to factor in. How how, how do you want that? component handled. And uh, like everything else, you until you know what you don't know, you can't <laughs> rectify that. 
because yep. you don't you don't know what you don't know. And then you know that you don't know something. Well, then you can start working on that. So you're saying that there are people like yourself and yourself included that could kind of through a consulting maybe tell us what, we're, what we need to do and go from there kind of thing. Yeah, I have I have three basic products. I will do a one-on-one co- consulting session with someone, with the college student I mentioned, 90-minute session going through the profile, going through the report I gave them, questions and answers, specifics to their needs. In her case, finding a job. What do you want to do? How do we go about getting into those companies? That was what our 90-minute session was based on. Then I have the ongoing consulting, like you just described, where they want to be doing all of these things, but they just don't have the sheer time to do it. They want somebody with the experience and capability to handle it for them on a weekly or monthly basis, depending on how they want it to be approached. And then my third component, which is where most of my business is coming from, is my sales focused LinkedIn training. So I do a 10 week course for companies that have a sales force of five or more people. Uh-huh. And it's technically 12 weeks because week number one and week number 12 belong to management where I'm talking to them about their teams and getting an understanding of their team. Week uh-huh. one, then weeks two through 11, we're going through this one hour training every week where it's, it's not training that most salespeople are used to. It's we're going through a specific sales book and we're talking about what resonated with them sales book and it's very interactive. And then there's also a LinkedIn component that corresponds with each session. We go through the 10 weeks. At the end of the 10 weeks, I give a report to management. I say, okay, here are your DIY people. They get this. They're running with it. They're doing great. The next tier is these people did pretty good. Maybe they need a little more help, but they're in pretty good shape. And then that next tier is these people are struggling. They're not really picking this up. And we're going to have to work more with them. And then the last tier is I'm not sure where you found this person. We might need help. Good. I'm always amazed that business sometimes doesn't realize that the person they think is an extremely great salesperson can't sell anything. They can't sell water to somebody in the desert. Yes. They can take an order from the person in the desert, but there's no, it's mind boggling to me that there are sales skills that sales people lack. Yeah. And, mo- and mo- most of them do. Yes. Yeah. I'm not beating up any salespeople, by the way, that are listening. I'm just saying that if you are a salesperson, we should have some basic sales skills and we, sh- we should be more than an order taker. We should be creating the opportunity, uh-huh. not, not just taking the order as it comes in, but that's my personal flaw. Yeah. Now, a great example of that, uh, several years ago, there was an article about a, a local company here in Maryland that the ownership was changing. It was a family company. It had been run by the same family for the last 100 years, and the oldest son was taking over. And my manager hands me the newspaper article and says, go get this guy. And I said, okay. And I started with my normal research. I looked on LinkedIn, didn't find him on LinkedIn. I looked on Facebook and I looked on Twitter and he had some company presence, but not him specifically. And I'm reading the article and it mentions his tie to a local chamber of commerce that he's on the board of directors for. And I go, well, hey, I, my friend Perry is on that same board of directors. I reach out to Perry. Perry, do you know Matthew? Would you mind introducing me? He says, absolutely. I'll be happy to introduce you. I go to meet Matthew, explain to him what it is that I do. And he's giving me all the reasons in the world why, well, it's just not a good fit right now. And I said, well, I tell you what, I want the opportunity to do business with you in the future. Why don't you give me the opportunity to audit your current services now? I said, not from the telescope of my company, but from the telescope of What's best for your business? And I'll show you where you're overspending and you shouldn't be. I said, I'm not talking about changing your providers or doing anything like that. I'm just talking about I'm going to audit what you have now. I'm going to tell you how to get it for a better price. And he said, okay, we'll work with my, my IT manager. She gives me all the bill copies. And I said, all right, give me a couple of weeks. I'll work through this and I'll come back. Two weeks later, I come back and she's got this big, you know, poo-eating smile on her face and goes, 
So, Mike, did you find thousands of dollars to save us on our services? And I said, actually, it looks like you are spending about $50,000 a year more than you need to. So we save your company about $4,000 a month. And she just stared at me in disbelief and said, you're making that up. I said, no, I'm not making it up. I, I wrote up a report. And I'm going to walk you through every component of the report. And I'm going to show you how you go about fixing these things. And at the end of that, she was completely flabbergasted. She goes, I have no idea how this happened. I said, don't understand. This isn't any one specific person's fault. I said, these things just happen. And my skill set is understanding these and auditing them. I've now given you the tools to make it right. And what I want is six, 12 months from now, when your contract's up, I want the opportunity to bid on your business. And I got it. Yep. I got the opportunity and I got the account. All because you're a salesperson. All because I wasn't a salesperson. Oh, okay. well, okay. Well, okay. we can argue on that <laughs> one, on what that what, what our sales <laughs> definition is. So here's the million-dollar question, I think. Okay. Or maybe not. Maybe it's only a half-million-dollar question. It's still enough of a, enough money to ask the question. I'm brand new. I don't have a LinkedIn account. Mm -hmm. But I want one now. I'm excited. I think I can utilize this. So today is day zero. How long does it take to have a downline that would say what most people would say is relatively large? I don't know what that number is. Let's just assume for a second. I want to talk to 5% of my city on, in my LinkedIn. Is that even possible? And how long would that take? It absolutely is possible. And it really is going to depend on how much time, effort, and energy you put into developing. LinkedIn has this benchmark of 500 plus connections. That seems to be the magic number. Once you get to 500, everything just flows a lot faster. And people's first response is, oh, well, I don't know 500 people. And actually, you, you do. Yeah, you do. You do. Look at your cell phone. You think about, yeah, look, look at your cell phone. Look at your Facebook friends. Look at your coworkers. They just don't always think to connect to these people. And that's why I've changed ABC to always be connected. Always be connecting. And so is 5% reasonable? Is, is, it a, is it a good platform from a size of LinkedIn friends? I don't even know what LinkedIn friends are called, if that's the word or not. Connections. 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 What's possible there? And when you say work it, I'm thinking of the guy or the gal that may not have the resource and understanding how to go out there. And so the resource of buying marketing, paid marketing, and the, or the resource of going out there and hustling for opportunity. And this seems like a platform mm -hmm. for that. Maybe that little bit of a shy person to get into an arena that starts noticing them so they can build their book of business. That's a great way to put it. It's absolutely for that opportunity. The solopreneur, as I like to call it. What did, what was I say that one more time? Solopreneur. I get that. It's a good word. How long would it take me? How much effort? Let's, let's look at the effort now instead of length. The effort on a daily basis, a half an hour, 10 minutes, an hour, you know, because I would assume that LinkedIn can be done at night as well as it could be done during the day. So we could do it on that. It is 24 seven because it is global. So it doesn't really, you know, we can be doing it on the non-productive hours of our day, right? Uh-huh. Absolutely. And not have it interfere with, you know, the day job that actually makes me money, which if you start network marketing and start marketing your center of influence, the day job won't matter. Yes. I see. I, I instantly just thought, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here. I instantly just thought this is a heck of a way to create job security for someone. Yes. Because if your employer is relying on your connections and these are your connections, if they go sideways, you, your, your connections don't go sideways. They, they're yours, right? Correct. What a great thing. There, I can see the immense value as an employer because I have some sales for, I have a sales force. Immense value for those salespeople to have their own connections selling my product because then they could sell my product for somebody else. So it's that other person's product if someone gave them a better job or better opportunity. So I can see the importance of that. Sorry, I got on that tangent. No, nope, it's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. So what makes you different? Why you? I think my biggest difference is I'm teaching from the perspective of experience. I've met a lot of LinkedIn users that 
don't practice what they preach. I, I'm, I'm connected to this one fellow, and he's a really nice guy. And by all accounts, he seems to know a lot about LinkedIn. But he's always sending me his broadcasts about hiring his services. And after the first four or five times that I said, hey, John, you do know I'm a LinkedIn consultant, right? I just stopped. I ignored him. <laughs> I stopped. And many of the LinkedIn professionals out there are academics. They, they learned it and from a social media standpoint. They saw the value. And that's why they started teaching it. But I'm telling you that it works because I've earned a six-figure income four years in a row as a salesperson because it works. That's the difference. Right. There is a difference between talking it and walking it. And, and if, you're, if you're walking it, that's great. That's absolutely great. So is that your pet peeve that few people are actually – doing it themselves or utilizing it for themselves. What's your big pet peeve for LinkedIn? <laughs> My biggest pet peeve on LinkedIn is not customizing your communication. When you first reach out to connect with someone, LinkedIn has this generic that pops in that says, I would like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. If it's your mother, even, delete yeah. that. Hey, mom, glad to see you're on LinkedIn. Let's connect now personalize it. Mike, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I really appreciated your time. Mary, it was so great to see you at the high school reunion last week. I hope we can work together in the future. Do something that says I'm not a robot. I am a person. Right. And that, you know, I, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, well, gosh, you know, if, if they say I have 800 contacts in my outlook, which I probably do, that take me 800 of those you know, attempts or, or, or sins. But I guess if we just divide it, okay, so you're not doing 800 all at one time, right? Correct. You're going to say, okay, what's, what's reasonable? Do 10 a day, do 30 a day. And in 30 days you have nine, you know, have them all done. So I guess we have to take baby steps. It's not like we're going to have, you know, no LinkedIn exposure today and be the, the most popular LinkedIn guy tomorrow. Correct. We have to baby steps and we'll get out and run this marathon. Yeah, the, the good news is, though, you can quickly build it up in as little as 30 okay. days. That's an important number for a lot of people because especially when you're in the industry of sales, and like you said earlier, we're all yeah. in the industry of sales. We're all salespeople. We may not understand embedded commands, as, or some may not understand them as well as we do, but we're all in sales. So I think getting be able to get to that that level of exposure is important as fast as possible. So – you gave us your website, but this time when you give it to me, will you spell it out? Because I would not, I would not, I know how to spell Mike. I, I just, you know, it's one of those things we're angels. So we've got that going on for us, but how do you, how do you spell that last name? And where's, what's the website name again? It's MikeSheila.com. It's M I K E S H E L A H.com. So it's not .net. It's not .us. It's not .co. It's .com. It is dot com. And naturally, you will find me on LinkedIn. You will also find me on Twitter at Mike Sheila. You will find me on Instagram at Mike Sheila. And you will find me on Facebook, Mike Sheila Consulting. And before long, you're, they're going to find you on my podcast website. And, um, man, you're just going to be all over. <laughs> oh, you, you raise a very good point. I mentioned the free report for everybody. For your audience, everybody that is listening. If they sign up for one of my one-on-one -on -one consults, they get 50% off the consult. They are normally $250. That first 90-minute session will only be 125 They just have to mention that they heard me on your podcast. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I do that because once they've had the chance to work with me and they see the value, they're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell their coworkers, they're going to tell their boss who has a sales force of 10 or more people, and those are really the opportunities where I get to have the most fun. Well, I'm working with a company that has a sales force of five or more people. And that's, that's really where the fun for me comes. Can I ruin your day a little bit? Sure. Okay. If you don't mind, we have not pre, we haven't chatted about this before. We have just met. I'm almost doing like, do I know you? Cause I'm going to just blurt this out. So your consult is how much? 125. If they come through this podcast. Yep. Normally it's 250. Today it's 125 for a 90 okay. minute session. 
Okay. Don't think I'm crazy. I am crazy, but you don't have to think it. I'm going to start talking to my coaching students. Coaching students, 10 of you, just 10, not 9, not 11, 10 of you, the first 10 that take him up on that offer, I will pay you the coaching fee or the the one-on-one fee. So I will pay your one-on-one fee to the first 10 people that are in my coaching program that contact him. Okay, coaching students, I know there's more than 10 of you. So the first 10 that respond, I'm going to pay for. I don't think it gets better than that. Sorry to do that to you, Mike. I apologize. But what you've told me today, you know, being in the back seat here listening to you, I can see the benefit, the huge benefit with your service. The fact that folks can market to their center of influence, to market to like type people, to expand their network so that they're not under their employer's, you know, thumb or they're not under that, that job's thumb is tremendous. And the benefit of, of the six degrees of separation, I think is going to be huge. So if I could do that for 10 of my coaching students with you, I would appreciate that. Mike, you've officially become the most podcast interviewer I have met yet. I've done what? You have officially become the most awesome podcast interviewer I have met yet. I, I, I heard you say awesome, but I just like that word so much that it's, I it's had to a great word. say it again. Awesome is awesome. Man, I, I'm going to go home and tell my wife I'm awesome because my she, she uses up. another she uses another word. We can't say it on a podcast. I love you, baby. <laughs> It's been fun. I am going to post your information on the webpage. Thank you. And um, I appreciate the opportunity. There's going to be 11 of us that, that take up on, take you up on this offer, the 10 coaching students. And I'm going to ask one of my people here in my office to get a hold of you because I think you, your resource and what you have to offer, and I'm not a big promoter of what people have to offer, but the whole concept of center of influence is, is enormous. So I'm going to have someone in my office on our behalf, chat with you as well. Thank you so much, sir. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Much appreciated. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that was fun. I tell you what, I wasn't a hundred percent certain what we were going to get to chat about, but my ears perked up and man, I've got ears. So when they perk up, they're perked up, but my ears perked up on that center of influence and just that networking and, and building your downline and just just being able to tell people what you do for a living from a business perspective, which is so much more powerful than it than than having that chatty, friendly thing over at that other place. And then that I'm so tired of Facebook censoring what I can see. I am frustrated about that. I can I can tell you it's absolutely frustrating. And the idea that that censorship isn't a platform or, or an experience that I'm going to have with LinkedIn, and the fact that it's so easy. Man, I've got hundreds and hundreds of people that I'm going to put in my LinkedIn. And man, if you're a coaching student of mine, the first 10 of you, I'm going to pay for your your one-on-one. Yes, I know, I'm crazy. But you know what? Your success is important to me. And this is an important step. Now, if you're not one of the 10 and you're a coaching student, you should still do this. You guys should still do this. If you were wanting a bigger reach for a minor marketing cost, what is that? What's the cost of his consultation? 125? 125 to set yourself up or to understand the platform? Maybe he's going to charge you more to do more for you later? I don't know. But man, and I harp on that center of influence. This is a great platform. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. It was fun for me. I And I hope you guys are enjoying these interviews. They're different than just the real estate podcasts, and they're certainly different than the daily deals. But I think there's some power in learning other things, because the more we know, the more experience and more things we can have to communicate about with our prospects themselves. So all this stuff is good. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.